you're joining in. Welcome everybody as you're joining in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We'd like to thank you all for joining us, taking your time uh, to attend with us Women's Health Initiative. And I'm going to hand over to the person who put this program together, Dr. Mirbat al who needs uh, no introduction. Uh, she is the first uh, woman interventional cardiologist, not just in Saudi Arabia, but the entire Gulf area. She is a highly active in uh, women's health initiatives. She's a member of the American College of Cardiology, Women in Cardiology Council, as well as on the Board of Trustees of Society of Coronary and Geography and Intervention. In fact, she has a lot of uh, great uh, achievements. So I will hand over to Mirvat now. Thank you, Dr. Waqar, not only for the introduction, really, but for as the governor of the American College of Cardiology in the um, kingdom, for both endorsing and promoting this kind of a project. I think it is long overdue, and I think it is time to cross borders and um, cross specialties and engage our colleagues in internal medicine, engage our colleagues in OBGYN, and work towards um, improving health of women. And I think we all agree here on this panel that as we improve the health of women, we really do improve the health of the community. At the end of the day, um, women are the family makers um, and, and they, the cornerstone for um, keeping a healthy family, children, etc. But it is important to learn how to do it and to do it right. So this is what we're going to discuss today. And I'm going to hand over to both um, Dr. Mehta and Dr. Um, Roxana Mehran and um, Annabelle Volkman to take over. I'd love to sit back and just kind of enjoy the discussions that are going to come out today because I personally want to learn. I'm a leader in establishing um, heart centers. Uh, and so I think it is a golden opportunity for um, me and everybody else who's watching us today to, to, to learn. So over to you, ladies. Thank you so much, Dr. Alaznag. Um, thank you, everyone, for um, in, inviting us and uh, doing this international in, um, conversation about um, building women's heart programs. Um, Dr. Roxana Moran are the moderators of this program, and I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Lakshmi Mehta, who is the professor of medicine at the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine at The Ohio State uh, University. She holds a Sarah Ross Sutter Endowed Chair in Women's Cardiovascular Health and is the director of the Women's Cardiovascular Health Program. Dr. Nasser is also uh, a panel discuss, uh, one of our panelists, and she is the Secretary General of the Egyptian Society of Cardiology and head of the department at the Suez Canal um, University. I hope I got that right. Um, uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, our first um, speaker um, will be Dr. Elida Chifo, who is a senior. It's a, a real pleasure to share in this. Annabelle, if it's okay, I thought maybe I can just say a couple of words. Um, of course, of course, Dr. Yeah, so yeah. I just wanted to, it's really wonderful to be with you with uh, Dr. Volkman. I, I wanna really thank the organizers, Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Um, Alassane, and um, all of the um, organizers for this important meeting. I can't, I can't underline the importance of having a conversation around the table regarding heart centers for women. I believe uh, this used to be uh, a, um, a, a thought process and many people have developed programs, but I think it's really, and Dr. Volgman, I know that you, Dr. Lakshmi, so many have developed very, very successful programs. What we believe that these, this kind, these kinds of programs have to become part and parcel of the fabric of cardiology because heart disease in women is different. It has uh, different collaborators across the board and we all need to speak the same language and train our trainees in understanding sex-specific outcomes that is related to cardiovascular disease in women. 
And as such, I think it's important to hear the perspectives of some of the experts who are speaking to us today. And it really is a true honor to see this kind of program across the Middle East and especially in the Gulf region and especially within the kingdom. And it's wonderful to see that it is being embraced. And so um, without further ado, I'll give that back to you, uh, Dr. Volkman. As you know, I'm kind of in between. I'm also looking at, um, I'm, I'm looking at this. I may go off screen a little bit because I'm on an, uh, another meeting, but it's really, really important to see what amazing speakers we have. Um, Ale de Kiefo, um, uh from Milan, uh, Dr. Wenger from uh, Emory, Dr. Uh, Parapid, um, uh, as well, I mean, so many of the legends speaking to us today about what it takes and how we get these programs started and why do we need a rationale for such a program. But um, it's a wonderful, wonderful symposium. I can just tell you that Women as One is incredibly honored to be part of this. So thank you for having us and thank you for having me uh, as the moderator of the session. I'm, I'm staying and watching with all of my uh, hardiness. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moran. Um, I guess I should introduce myself as well. I'm Dr. Annabelle Vogman. I'm a, a, a professor at, of cardiology at uh, Rush University Medical Center, and I started the Heart Center for Women at Rush uh, in uh, October 2003. So we'll be celebrating our 20 year anniversary next year, and you're all invited. Uh, I don't know what we're going to do, but you're all invited. Um, so it, this has been, um, you know, our uh, mission is to help women with heart disease or at risk for heart disease. And I'm so glad that um, we are doing this now on an inter international basis. Dr. Parpid invited uh, Dr. Wenger and several of us to um, go to Serbia to um, be to um, inaugurate her Nanette Wenger um, Heart Center for Women. And that was really such a great, um, great initiative. And uh, I'm so grateful to be part of that. So um, I think um, without further ado, I think we want to make sure that we have time for questions and answers at the end. Um, so Dr. as Dr. Moran already mentioned, Dr. Um, Chifo is our first speaker. She is a senior interventional cardiologist and director of research in interventional cardiology in San Raffaele um, Hospital in Milan, Italy, which I will be going to in a few days. So I can't wait to be in Italy. Um, without further ado, Dr. Chifo. Yeah, so thank you. First of all, thanks uh, for the invitation. It's something uh, very important, so important. And uh, there is also a key role uh, in our European association, in the APCI, really. We don't need uh, more data on this, and we do, do need to organize our center to better allocate uh, the patient care and the care of our women. So my topic is uh, uh, the rationale for the program uh, and why do we think it's time now with our, the issue we are encountering on a global uh, perspective uh, and why it's time now. So please, uh, the next slide. So as you all know, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of mortality in women. We all know, but honestly, not our patient, not all our patient know. And just to put you in perspective, and we are all physicians and we know that, that this is the first killer and only the fourth killer is breast cancer. However, when you ask to our women patient, they are not aware of that. And they still think the first killer is indeed breast cancer. So there is a lot of lack of communication or not uh, careful communication done to our patient level. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the topic, awareness. Awareness that heart disease is the leading cause of death among women. And this is very interesting, decline from 2009 to 2019. And uh, you can see this in the publication of a couple of years ago in circulation, the decline of knowledge that was gone between 2009, 2019. And this is particularly uh, present among Hispanic, non-Hispanic and black women, but also, and this is quite, I have to say, frightening among young women, younger women. 
in whom prime order and primary prevention may be most effective. So an urgent redoubling of efforts by organization interested in women's health is required in order to really reverse these trends. Next slide, please. And this is another important topic, underrepresentation of women in all cardiovascular clinical trials. Women are underrepresented, sex-specific data are underreported, women represent less than 39% of cardiovascular clinical trial participants between 2010 and 2017, and this underrepresentation limits the potential for developing sex-specific strategy and recommendation for cardiovascular disease in women. And this again is not an old publication, but is a publication from two years ago in circulation. Uh, next slide, please. In socially deprived regions, women have higher cardiovascular disease mortality than men. And women, especially women with minority ethnicity are overrepresented among people living in poverty in high income countries with associated negative effects on health and access to care. Women are especially affected by the association of low socioeconomic status and cardiovascular risk. And this is evidence is coming from, again, a, a publication that was made in 2017 in JAC. Next slide, please. But also in high income regions, the decline in cardiovascular disease mortality has slowed. And cardiovascular mortality has increased in women for certain countries. And again, these are data that are coming from recent publication from 2019. Next slide, please. And another important, another alert that really represent one of the rational why we do need some dedicated centers or dedicated patient care on women. There is an increase in myocardial infarction in young women. And this is uh, present uh, not only in US, you can see data coming from US showing that hospital admissions with acute coronary syndrome in women younger than 55 years has increased of 21% until 99 and 31% until 2014. But also from uh, Europe, because uh, on the left are showed the data coming from a study published in European our journal in 2017 with French women less than 65. So this is an alert, an alert that at least in Western countries, there is an increase in myocardial infarction in young women. And so there is need to do preventive prevention in this, in this population. Women are less likely to receive guideline recommended treatment. And again, these are evidences that are coming from recent trials on the left, it is shown the um, patient with myocardial infarction and the usage of which are known to be medication that are needed and life saving in, in patient experience myocardial infarction. So more likely to be given in men are all the first line therapy, aspirin, non-aspirin and platelet, lipid lowering agent, beta blocker, invasive angiography and coronary vascularization, anything go within the line for men. And also the trends in percentage of women and men feeling a high intensity starting prescription after hospital discharge is in favor of men and not of women. Next slide, please. And another important point, the evidence on female specific cardiovascular risk face, uh, factors is increasing. Younger women, it's important to know the age of menarche, preterm menopause, pregnancy. We have learned that pregnancy related um, adverse outcomes are risk factors. And mostly in all the studies that we are doing, we are lacking to collect this data gestational diabetes, gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, preterm birth are all known cardiovascular risk factors. And then also to target older women, menopause and hormone replacement therapy. Again, these are factors that normally are not taken into account and indeed are well known to be risk, uh, cardiovascular risk factors specific for female population. Next slide, please. And many cardiovascular risk factors in women are still under-recognized 
and strongly associated with female gender and interaction with the woman's social and physical environment. Next slide, please. COVID-19 pandemic, and that's the last, is a strong reminder on how sex and gender factors can interact to negatively affect women's cardiovascular act. And COVID-19 pandemic has shown inexorably on how the socioeconomical status and cultural role of the women in society affect the physical and mental health and well-being of women globally. Next slide. And this is only 10 out of many reasons why the time is now. Next slide, please. There are so many opportunities to deliver comprehensive care and intervene for women cardiovascular health. And this has to be done longitudinally from younger age, taking into account congenital heart disease and healthy diet and working on lifestyle, preventing childhood obesity and all the risk factor intervening, for example, in the smoking habitus that is more frequent in young female and teenagers and all what we have been discussing, pregnancy, to prevent gestational diabetes, hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, preterm delivery, and then going to the menopause and central obesity and metabolic risk factor and until the latest stage and loneliness and social isolation with all diseases that are more specific with women. Next, please. And this bring up together with the guidance of Roxana, <laughs> this uh, our moderator, to this fantastic uh, effort that was done together. Roxana led us, there were more than 17 commissioners. All together, uh, we wrote the Lancet Clinical Commission on Cardiovascular Disease in Women and How to Reduce Global Burden by 2030. Uh, next, uh, the aim of this commission was to reduce, and this is quite ambitious, I have to say, the global burden of cardiovascular disease in women by 2030, promote cardiovascular health, improve outcomes for women worldwide, identify existing evidence and gaps in cardiovascular research, treatment, and access to care, and going into the direction of global awareness of sex and gender specific. Next, please the prevalence of cardiovascular disease. This was touched in this very important uh, paper and document. And there was a decrease uh, in the global age uh, standardized prevalence of cardiovascular disease until two, uh, uh, 2010. However, there has been again a slight increase since 2010. Next, please. What about the mortality? Again, the mortality went slowed down, but however, over the last decade is still increasing. Next slide. A risk factor for cardiovascular disease in women we discussed briefly before. Well established is the same as men, but we do have sex specific that need to be investigated that we discussed priorly. And there are also under-recognized, and this was a very important point that was touched in the document, uh, social risk factors, social economic deprivation, intimate partner violence, poor healthy literacy, and environmental risk factors that we should take into account. Next, please. And risk factor among vulnerable population, low socioeconomic status, traditional religious roles and norms for women that may be leave them not taken care of because there is less likelihood of these women to refer to their cardiologist in minority status. Next, please. And some recommendations that came up next, please, from the document, identifying diseases that are female specific, that mostly of the population are unaware. And I have to say also most of our uh, male cardiologists or interventional cardiologists sometimes do not take into account all the importance of uh, um, inoca the presence then of, of non-obstructive coronary artery disease we do need more data coming from that we do need to collect the data of this patient inoca the presence of myocardial infarction again without the evidence at the coronary angiography of obstructive coronary disease and target vessel. Spontaneous coronary artery dissection. Again, there was a call from the Lancet Commission 
to really investigate and uh, um, collect data on these, as well as all ST elevation MI, and maybe ST elevation MI coming in a women population without known risk factors. Next, please. Heart failure, there is uh, the issue of heart failure with preserved, low, uh, pre preserved ejection fraction in women and to be further investigated. Takatsumo syndrome, again, this is cardiomyopathy, more specific for women, we still need to better understand the mechanism and to collect data, as well as peripartum cardiomyopathy. Peripartum cardiomyopathy is affecting one woman out of 2,000 women in the Western countries. However, the prevalence is much higher in some countries such as North of Africa. But honestly, there are very few data, very few registries. So whatever is the real prevalence is unknown. And just to give you an idea, 40% of these patients do not recover from peripartum cardiomyopathy. So it's important to have centers detecting these disease and given the best uh, care for this patient. Next, and all the issue of cerebrovascular accident in women, they need to be better addressed, as well as vascular dementia. That was very interesting to know that, for example, in Australia, this was the first cause of, of morbidity and mortality in the women population, as well as the peripheral arterial disease Again, raise of awareness and care and treatment of this patient. Next, please. And cardiovascular disease and pregnancy. Again, we said the importance to prevent what are known to be then cardiovascular risk factor and importance of the interaction with our OBS and the concept of cardio obstetrics, which is an emerging multidisciplinary team approach and crucial for optimal care for women with cardiovascular disease during pregnancy. As well as the prevalence of rheumatic heart disease, I in certain regions of the world, so importance to target this patient. And multidisciplinary cooperation combined with appropriate preconception counseling and antenatal care is crucial to reduce complication from rheumatic heart disease in this region in pregnancy. Next, and this is uh, the website where you can collect all the information from this very important work that was done. Next, and this is, for example, a proposal that I think is going to be further discussed of a women's health center. At the center, there is the women, the care of the women, and together there is the, the working group the team composed from cardiologists taking care about cardiovascular risk assessment, sex differences in traditional risk factors, sex specific risk factor, sex predominant risk factors, evaluation of specific genders, disease such as Inoka, Minoka, and old variants, and interaction with OBS, so cardiobstetrics, again, take into account pre-existing risk factors, acquired CVD, adult congenital heart disease, the management of adverse pregnancy outcomes. Cardio-oncology, that's another very important topic. Not often there is this link between oncologists and cardiologists, but we know that history of cancer, radiation, chemotherapy, and overlapping CVD risk factors, as well as the new biological chemotherapy that can really create cardiotoxicity and have to be considered, diagnosed and followed up. Menopause. Menopause represents a long time of the life of our women. There is not so much discussion about that, but this is an important target for us. And cardio, uh, cardio neurology. Again, the link between CVD risk factor and cerebrovascular event, dementia and stroke. Next, please. And the Women's Health Center team, this was proposed some year ago. There was a circulation uh, publication, Earth Center for Women, where there is patient care that we have been discussed, uh, discuss, awareness, because it's important to raise awareness in our population in the patient, but also in all healthcare professional, academic and education, patient education and research. So this is how, at least in my vision, should be composed in a women health center team. 
So thanks for your attention is the next slide. Thank you so much um, for that comprehensive talk. And uh, I was just going to warn you that you should probably stop until you showed our slide. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker, I'm really excited to hear what she'll um, have to say. Uh, the title of her talk is Digital Health Tools for a, um, a Program. Dr. Ada Mohammed al Kinabet is the Chief Officer of Public Health Intelligence at the Public Health Authority in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction and, and for that comprehensive overview by Dr. Sheffel. Um, I would like to add before I go into mine um, and contextualize um, a bit to Saudi. Um, so when you look at the cardiovascular trends and Dr. Sheffel had um, touched on it. There has been trends that are changing in Saudi, and we need to add in the Gulf region, the changes in um, behavior has dra drastically um, changed in the past 30 to 40 years. Um, and therefore, uh, chronic diseases uh, that lead, uh, or risk factors that lead to CVD have changed drastically from the era of our grandparents, our grandmothers, mothers, to, to our generation. And I think that is something that the region needs to also focus on and pay attention to, which is driving the burden of disease, and we expect it to, to accelerate in the near future. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so I, I'm trying to um, research this topic. Uh, so my background, I'm an epidemiologist, data is our, you know, it's our thing, this is what we focus on, and looking into how the digital health in general drives uh, healthier behavior or healthier outcomes. Um, so I wanted to touch about on the definition of digital health and then trying to um, uh, look into the, uh, what exists when it comes to definitions. Now, digital health is, is something new. It's, uh, it's coming along and the pandemic had, uh, has pushed it forward to the forefront of uh, tools or ways to uh, care for patients. In uh, 2018, the, there was a, an, a World Health Assembly that passed a resolution on digital health to promote, uh, to promote healthy lives and well-being for everyone, everywhere at all ages. Um, and so, you know, you can, you can maybe figure out this, that the concept includes a range of functions from promoting uh, the sustainable development goals, the SDGs, equi equitable and universal access to quality health services, increasing health system sustainability, accessibility, affordability, uh, strength, strengthening health promotion, disease prevention, treatment, rehab, and palliative care. And you can see it's, you know, it's very condensed of what digital health entails. And so trying to sum up um, the crossover or the overlap or what we're trying to target when we talk about digital health and women health is quite challenging given, given that not only are we talking about diseases that affect women during pregnancy and, and, and afterwards, but also chronic diseases that affect both men, women and, when, and men. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. So the resolution defined digital health as the field of knowledge and practice associated with an aspect of adopting digital technologies to improve health from inception to operation. And this, again, encompasses so much, um, which includes also e-health. Um, if yeah, And so again, when you look into what are the agencies that defined it, WHO in itself, you would find a definition in the World Health Assembly document. You would also find it, another one on the uh, WHO Europe um, webpage. And again, it, it just sums up that it's a very uh, wide array of different tools that are used to uh, collect data, to monitor patients and improve their health. And here comes up the word big data, which is um, another kind of, uh, 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 you hear that phrase a lot now, you hear AI, and these are two different um, uh, scopes or aspects within digital health that come up in not only to improve, of course, uh, or try accessibility for patients, but also evaluating that accessibility and also trying to improve uh, these different tools and uh, therefore improve outcomes for patients. If you can go. Uh, so finally, there's also telehealth, uh, 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 a phrase that's used, and the Center of Con for Connected Health Policy in the U.S. Uh, uh, defines this as a collection of means or methods for enhancing the healthcare, public health and health education delivery and support using telecommunications and technologies. And, and what I would like to um, try to highlight here is given this wide um, definition, trying to actually assess it systematically uh, is quite challenging. And we need to keep that in, um, in account when we try to uh, 
select for our patients the best methodologies within digital health that can improve their outcomes. Next, please. So um, now under the umbrella of digital health, the WHO identifies interventions, digital health interventions as different ways in which digital health and mobile technologies are being used to support health system needs. And again, what I would like to highlight here is, as you can see, is that this can be something that is issued uh, by uh, healthcare facilities, or this is something that the patient herself can actually search. And therefore, um, we need to be also careful when we guide our patients and when uh, and to have proper uh, patient education to try to gear them or try to push them towards the more evidence-based tools versus uh, more, let's say, fad uh, apps or that may not necessarily be conducive to a better health. Next, please. So um, what, what do you want, where, where are we, why are we focusing on women? And I think Dr. Sheffo um, has focused on the cardiovascular part and I would like to kind of go a little bit more um, general and say, and, and just mention these statistics from the WHO that over uh, 800 women globally still die every day in pregnancy and childbirth. One in three women suffer from violence. Depression is twice likely to affect women than men. Social and economic effect of the pandemic on women was more than it was in men. And, and these are key statistics that we need to bear in mind, trying to facilitate um, the most efficient way that women can access health if they're not able to do it physically, and also how to improve that in, in making it more evidence-based for them to actually not only have it uh, be accessible, but also efficient. Next, please. So uh, what does the evidence tells us? So when, when looking into what exists in literature uh, about uh, digital health and women health, the main focus is on uh, health care during, during pregnancy and after, so obstetric, obstetric and gynecology. Uh, when you look into more specific cardiovascular, chronic diseases, less um, evidence or less um, research has been done uh, that is geared specifically on how uh, digital health interventions improve uh, outcomes in for chronic diseases, specifically, let's say, cardiovascular disease. And so, um, and, and however, if we look at the scope of what exists when it comes to these tools in general, digital health tools, that you will find the majority of them focus on exercise, diet, and wellness. And so that's the scope of these different tools, di digital tools that exist. Uh, the tools uh, that, are, that are, we, I've found that have some are more extensive research on is text messaging when it comes to women. I'm, I'm talking here specifically when it comes to women. Um, and uh, you can see in these um, uh, studies that uh, text messaging can help reinforcement of existing behavior, but not start new healthy behavior. And that's, again, that's where the uh, uh, healthcare provider uh, needs to be very um, uh, specific on what they're trying to achieve with their patients and what we in um, uh, public health or in, you know, individuals or professionals that are in digital health, what are trying to achieve. And so um, not only exposing the patient or having them access these uh, tools, but making sure that these tools to an extent are able to achieve the goals they're intended for. Um, so text messaging was one of them that popped uh, up a lot in, in research and its effect or how much uh, efficacy does it have to try to modify or improve uh, behavior. Now, when it comes to efficacy, um, as I mentioned, a lot has been done in the obstetric field. Um, and they found that telehealth shows promising results and effect, effectiveness in care. Um, and whether it's during obstetric, the care of the, uh, the mother, or also accessing for, for need of uh, if there's more, more complications or follow up. And um, the evidence, there is a, a good number of studies that shows us that this can be used as an efficient way of carrying on health care in instances where the mothers or women in general are not able to access a physical, physically their health care healthcare providers. Um, but again, I would like to kind of highlight again here, I think I faced challenges trying to uh, find concrete evidence that gives us more kind of um, solidified uh, pathways into uh, trying to as uh, uh, assist our physicians in what are more efficient um, uh, uh, interventions that can be used. And when you look at the science, it's still developing, it's still um, going, you know, trying to figure out what is 
uh, more efficient and what is more effective. Uh, next, please. So what are the challenges? And I think I may have touched on, on some of them. I'll start with the part that pertains to di the digital health itself. And so um, uh, if you can go to the next slide. Okay, so uh, before I move to the women's health, digital health part, you'll see that there is um, the number of apps, the number of tools that exist are increasing as we speak. The problem is the technology is increasing as a much, uh, at, a, at a much faster pace than the evidence is when it comes to supporting these different apps or trying to, let's say, weed in which ones of these are more effective, which one of them uh, actually help with healthcare. And that makes it, in, in, a, in a sense, more challenging for the healthcare provider to decide and try to you know, uh, choose and weed through the different, th these many uh, different tools and intervention, interventions digitally that exist. And so um, I think uh, there's, there needs to be focus when it comes to, from the scientific um, uh, community to trying to actually uh, uh, prove or disprove the efficacy of these um, digital uh, tools. And again, uh, I you cannot emphasize enough the correct information provided to patients based on the existing tools for the patients. Now, when I when I when you move on to um, challenges that face women in digital health, um, more specifically, uh, next slide, please. So, um, as you may. Uh, figure out insufficient investment results in the continuation of inequity. So again, not only inequity or health inequity, but also uh, invest in insufficient investments in that still exist to this day. We've done, you know, the world has come along when it comes to women equity, but we're still not there yet. And that needs to be always highlighted when we're talking about women's health and therefore um, investing more when it comes to specific causes pertaining to women. Um, there is still insufficient representation of women in the technology workforce. So only about one in one woman to or in 50 men uh, exist at this point of time. This has, has this was affected also during the pandemic, reducing that percentage or that representation, um, which you may uh, be healthcare providers, maybe there was an increase in representation of women in healthcare providers, however, in technology um, uh, area, no, that, that number went down. There's a disproportionate representation of women in leadership positions. Um, we all know this. This is um, not just um, general leadership, but also when it comes to healthcare leadership and public healthcare leadership. And this. Uh, Ada, we're, we're not able to hear you. Oh, uh, can you hear me? There now? you go. Yes. Okay. I'm please, sorry. Please wrap so, up. <laughs> yes, yeah, I have one more slide and we're out. And so um, just to kind of uh, wrap up or conclude this, uh, I would like to go back and address uh, more again uh, in, in the kind of the 10,000 feet view, not just focusing on one area, but I, I the six priorities that the WHO focuses on when we talk about gender inequality and again, what happened in COVID and how it affected women, elevating the position of women in healthcare and health and care uh, workforce, Preventing uh, and uh, uh, prevent and respond to violence uh, against women, and the final three are ensure quality uh, se sorry quality sexual and reproductive health for all, reduce non-communicable diseases among women, and finally increase women's participation and leadership in science and public health. And I think that was my last slide. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ada. And we now have Dr. Wenger with us. And um, I will introduce the two next speakers. Um, we only have about 20 minutes left. So um, please um, do your uh, talk. And we have another talk after this. Um, Dr. Nanette Wenger is a professor of medicine in the Division of Cardiology at the Emory School of Medicine and a consultant to the Emory Heart and Vascular Center. Women's Vascular Center, and Dr. Hanan, who will be speaking with her, Dr. Hanan Al Shamrani, is an associate professor in the Department of Gynecology at the King Abdulaziz um, University in Saudi Arabia. Welcome, Dr. Wenger and Dr. Shamrani. Well, first, let me say how important I think this session is. And I want to emphasize something that came out recently 
in a presidential advisory uh, of the American Heart Association. It was published just a few weeks ago in circulation. And basically it is a call to action to see if we can achieve equity in women's heart health. So that again, the emphasis that we place is something that women's heart centers can certainly advocate for. And one of the things that we said is that we need to change things about cultural emphasis. The cultural emphasis has been that the presentation, the risk factors, the outcomes for men were the gold standard. And when women were different, they were viewed as atypical or unusual. And of course, that this is a cultural presentation of data that has to change. And then we emphasized a number of gaps in research and the fact that research in women has neglected young women. And because of that, there is less awareness. It has neglected women in poverty. It has, in the US, neglected women of racial and ethnic minorities. And if we have women's centers, they can reach out to the women who are underserved by the traditional community. What I want to add to this mix of a women's heart health center is that it can serve as an emphasis and as a resource for research in the country, whether this be a third world country, a mid-level country, or whether it be an advanced country. Because here we have access to a population of women who are our patients, and they can participate in national and international research. And I want to address something that, again, you can look up online. And this is a group called WHAM, W-H-A-M, and it's called Women's Health Access Matters. And what the emphasis here is something that has not been placed before and saying that medical research gender gap holds back our health and economy and investing in women's health and in women's health research is good for the economy as well. The WAM group commissioned a study from the RAND Corporation finding that investing $300 million across three diseases, Alzheimer's, coronary disease, et cetera, would generate $13 billion in economic research. And sadly, what we see is that even though women are 50% more likely to die within the year following a heart attack than men, only 4% of the research dollars focus specifically on women. So one of the things that we can do with the Women's Heart Centers is to advance the emphasis on research in women and to provide a population if there are national or international studies. So if we double the funding, we would generate just a huge amount in return. It's a 9,500% return on investment. And cardiac disease, obviously being the leading cause of death in women, coronary disease, is where the focus should be. So my emphasis is that we need women's heart health centers. We need it to identify for women in our community that they have the traditional risk factors that men have, but the, even the traditional risk factors provide a different risk for women than for men. We have to display the risk profile for women. The diabetic woman is twice as likely to have heart disease than the woman who is non-diabetic that smoking is an increased risk for women. But there are a number of risk factors that are non-traditional, that are either unique to or that predominate in women. And high among these, as you just heard, are the complications of pregnancy. So the woman who has had preeclampsia during pregnancy, who's had preterm delivery, who's even had just hypertension or diabetes during her pregnancy, or who's had a small for gestational age baby, is at risk for coronary 
heart disease, for hypertension, for heart failure. And these women can be identified with a partnership among the cardiologists, the internists, and the OBGYN physicians. At the Emory Women's Heart Center, we have a cardiologist who meets women at their six week follow-up after preeclampsia, identifies for them if they have risk factors, identifies for them that they should not resume smoking, that they need to lose their baby weight, that they need to watch blood pressure, blood sugar, and cholesterol. And all of these non-traditional risk factors are important. Again, the woman who has systemic autoimmune disease, the woman with lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, the woman with lupus or, is not going to die from her lupus. She will die from cardiovascular complications. So again, we need the Women's Heart Center to form partnerships with the rheumatologists and all of the non-traditional risk factors. Now, very important is the issue of cardio-oncology because we now have wonderful therapies for breast cancer. And these wonderful therapies cure breast cancer. But sadly, I see these women in my clinic when they have the toxicities of breast cancer therapy. And I say, your breast cancer is cured, but now you have heart failure. So what we need to do is to have the women's heart centers involved in the research. What can we do to protect the heart from the toxicities of these wonderful uh, breast cancer chemotherapies? What can we do for the woman who has received radiation and is increased risk of having coronary heart disease? So again, what we are beginning to say is we'll have to build perhaps a different risk assessment model for women that has not only the traditional risk factors, but that weights them for their risk in women. And we have to add the non-traditional risk factors. This is what a women's heart center can do. It can partner with our colleagues across the cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular communities, and it can provide an area for research, and research is the answer to improving women's heart health. And let me use that as my introduction and let my overseas counterpart discuss. Thank you, Dr. Wenger. Dr. Alshamrani, did you want to add to what Dr. Wenger had to say? Uh, Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting me. My name is Dr. Hanan Shamrani, consultant of the GYN uh, at King Abdul Aziz University Hospital in Jeddah. I do also work in two uh, private uh, hospitals. My talk today is gonna to be about services that we provide uh, to women in uh, Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. So we provide uh, both surgical and non-surgical uh, care for women uh, during adolescence, pregnancy, menopause, and beyond. Next slide, please. Our team is uh, composed of an obstetrician, uh, general surgeon with uh, breast care um, subspecialization, radiologist, family doctor, nurse, and uh, nurse midwife, and also we have uh, established uh, referral pathways to um, nursing consultants, uh, to uh, fitness trainers. Uh, also, we can uh, uh, refer to our colleague cardiologist uh, if needed. Next slide, please. So our obstetric services uh, start with uh, planning for pregnancy, uh, spanning to uh, taking care of women during pregnancy and uh, uh, nursing. We also take care of high risk and low risk patients during pregnancy. Next slide, please. We, have, we offer also general gynecology services. Um, so we make sure that the patient does not get pregnant except when she, so about that, when she is ready for this with the conception uh, clinics. We offer benign diseases, gynecology treatments, 
minimal invasive procedures done whether in the clinic or in the daycare practices. Uh, also, we offer uh, postmenopausal uh, services with their HRT or bone health and breast cancer screening, which we do in collaboration with our uh, general surgeons, at, uh, as I said before. We have uh, several subspecialties, uh, whether uh, urogynecology uh, and the pelvic floor disorder, sexual dysfunction. We have three uh, consultants uh, in Jeddah only that offer this service. We have also our colleagues, the reproductive endocrinologist, oncologist, and uh, aesthetic gynecology is uh, quite uh, in demand uh, in our city recently as uh, part of the world. And as I mentioned before, we have uh, minimally invasive uh, surgery that was popular, especially at the time of COVID where patients cannot be admitted uh, to the hospital for various reasons. Next slide, please. Uh, well, in the private uh, practice, uh, we uh, have a uh, relation with our uh, fitness centers and uh, spa services that the patient also, we can guide them to in the uh, public, but they have unfortunately to pay for. But the nutritional services to establish a woman's uh, healthy weight, this is done in the both in the private and in the public uh, clinics. Next, please. We, for the preventive care for women, we have uh, cervical and uh, breast cancer screening programs, uh, age appropriate immunizations, uh, screening for sexually transmitted diseases, and uh, bone density screening uh, when appropriate. Uh, in order to uh, uh, increase uh, the availability of our uh, services to the patient, we need more space. We need to have uh, more locations in the city. And that's why, for example, I work in several centers because um, our city is expanding and um, there's always uh, some form of uh, traffic that hinders the patient from uh, reaching certain centers. Sometimes, uh, especially in our uh, public, uh, we always need a uh, renovation and uh, uh, upgrading our uh, technology. We also have to uh, be uh, qualified uh, and have additional qualified staff and nurses to come up with the best treatment available. Next, please. In order to, to do this, we have established call centers uh, uh, to uh, for appointments and uh, emergency call numbers. Also, the patients, uh, for example, can make their appointments uh, through the website. We have uh, to attract our patients and to stay in the same practice. We give them um, special packages sometimes. We arrange for them uh, to have special offers in certain fitness uh, centers or certain nutritionists. Next slide, please. The challenges that we, uh, we face is that, for example, health insurance does not cover uh, preventative care. And of course, it does not cover everyone. For example, if I want to have a mammogram for a patient or a pap smear done, then I have to say that the patient have a pathology. Otherwise, if I don't say that the patient, uh, when I examine her, I, I found a pathology, it will not be covered by the insurance. We have to establish more uh, centers in various parts of the city for patients uh, to be able to reach uh, the care when needed. We, uh, we need to increase our opening hours uh, to include uh, weekends when appropriate. Next, please. Perfect. Is it on? What? Is it uh, we have a problem with the budgeting, with, whether in the uh, private or in the public practice. Uh, the availability of qualified uh, Saudi staff is another problem. And collecting demographic and health surveys uh, is not as easy as in the West. Next, please. 
uh, also we face some other challenges uh, for the, when we have we have some lack of certain treatments that are important for women. For example, HRT is not readily available. We have to use other uh, forms. Um, and for example, decreased libido treatments are not available. Uh, when we want to come with uh, educational uh, materials and classes, we most of the doctors, we do it from our own budget. Next, please. So I think uh, my talk is a little bit uh, far from the uh, cardiovascular care, but it's uh, about what we do in Jeddah for uh, women, uh, basically. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, our next um, speakers um, are Dr. Biljana Parapit, who is Dr. Parapit is a, an assistant professor of medicine at Belgrade University School of Medicine and honorary Proctor H. W. Harvey, teaching professor at Georgetown University in Washington, DC. And our other speaker for the topic of how to get started is um, Anise Cindy, who is um, a CEO and executive healthcare leader um, in uh, Saudi Arabia. So with that, that further ado, Dr. Parabid, would you like to start? Yes, I am so sorry. I'm just opening my, my slides and sharing my screen because something went a bit wrong, but we're all good, huh? Okay. I'm so sorry, it's opening something else for me that I don't want him to open, but it's just like that. Okay, here it is. Are you seeing it or am I just seeing it? It's still me just seeing it. Okay. We can't see it, yeah. So, yes, I'm so sorry. There we go. There, there. thank you so much. Okay, so I will try to be under uh, under eight minutes. So um, how to get started? I'll tell you how I eventually started, but I'm not sure if that's the way, but I hope it is the way. So again, uh, thank you, uh, Saudi chapter of the ACP for inviting me. It's great to be in Jeddah, even virtually for some third or first time now, but uh, I usually joke and I start my conflicts of interest with the fact that I'm a WIC and I'm an ACC WIC. I was a leadership council member trained by Dr. Volgman, uh, uh, Wood, Nerez, and uh, Tonya Singh and Claire Duvernois. So, and I was the founding chair of the ACC Inter International Working Group that Dr. Mervat Dallas Nash is proudly our new a new chair for a year now, and she's making great progress with this agenda of ours. My only missing conflict of interest here is, this is my slide from ACC actually, uh, is the fact that I was, I think, among the first 50 uh, WIC who signed up in the talent directory of women as one. So again, thank you to Mara for everything you do for all of us. So I'm going to briefly run through the four papers that we have pretty much seen so far. I'm going to delve a bit into ours. The first one is the one that Dr. Kiefer closed her, her talk with, and it is the landmark paper of Dr. Lundberg from 2018. Uh, the second one is the one that appeared in December by Dr. Gulati, uh, Dr. Malvo, um, and myself also together with Dr. Kara Hendry, which was dedicated to Women's Heart Center, but it was more tailored to some Western budgeted medicine and Western dedicated uh, pathologies, not so much the global ones. So we have, before the presidential advisory, the Dr. Wenger just mentioned and that I put on this slide and it is actually our current, uh, 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 I cannot say we can put a, put on the hand or on the Bible on the Quran or on the, or, or on the whatever you pick as a, as a, as a religious uh, a paper for, for, uh, for one's religion, but it is a religion of its own being a wick who does women's health. So I would try to delve into what, what Dr. Wenger taught us many, many years ago, and that is the investigate, educate, advocate, legislate, the four pillars through which we have actually shown in our paper the initiatives that we have done over the past good four years. And how I started, I started actually with my regular clinic that was I was in attending already in 2006. So I started with that. I had I had a, I saw a lot of people from endo 
because, a lot of, because I was trained to do metabolic syndrome and insulin sensitivity in non-diabetic patients. Uh, as I was hired in the biggest department, which is an arrhythmia and heart failure one, uh, I was seeing arrhythmia patients all the time and learned the specificities of these women. Finally, the cardioobstetric clinic somehow came from my, my medical school days and my first papers on PCOS and risk factors in Serbian women and how they overlap with cardiovascular disease. My heart and mind clinic actually developed also from some research papers from, from my students' days where we addressed the issue of young stroke patients uh, in our population. Finally, we have called it here the medicine clinic. That's the clinic that we have, that Dr. Wenger just mentioned, and that's the huge load of patients from rheumatology, immunology, and hematology, which in our particular case is just this tiny clinic, so to speak, because we have very, very sex-specific and sex-oriented treatment in these specific uh, subspecialties, so we don't put them a lot unless they call us for in telemedicine consults. And finally, we have established in our model the lifestyle clinic. Why? Because I think that any woman employed percent healthcare system, and we have especially seen how much women have suffered during COVID, uh, needs to have a place in her workplace where she can go during her lunch break or take 30 minutes and go ask for advice, even if she's healthy. Of course, we're not denying it, as we said, to all the healthy relatives of all other women that are seen in other clinics. Finally, how I develop my infrastructure. Well, that is also something I'm going to show you for the pieces, what I had. So I was working in a tertiary center, so that was it. I had my research projects, which were epidemiological projects. First, I built sex-specific uh, projects that were sadly, uh, but I think that there is no woman who hasn't lived that, taken away from me, given to mediocre men who very often just didn't pursue it so much because they didn't see the idea behind it besides being a feminist. So I had my students and I kept teaching about how we need to know the differences. And finally, I was teaching that also to our residents and our fellows. Finally, in the past uh, 10 years, we had an increasing uh, load of patients from our, from our primary healthcare physician's offices with some new numbers that very much Medicare uh, that were sought for us to see every week. So all of a sudden I was seeing some 50 to 60 patients every week who were brand new. And fortunately I had the support of the primary healthcare physician center in my municipality. We still have the, the good old universal coverage here in, in Serbia that is, that is affording us a lot of things. But fortunately it's the advocacy that was taught to me by the ACC WIC more specifically since 2015-2016, that has helped me build other partnerships and, and seek sources that were not just government sources or my own sources, that, that, which, uh, which my colleague from, from Shopee just mentioned, how they cover for their own patients, where that was somehow something that I have also been doing while we were building this. So advocacy, advocacy, and only advocacy. We organized the first conference that we call Dr. Nanette Kesswanger Women's uh, Cardiovascular Health Conference uh, in December 2018. The three brave women from, from the uh, delegated by the ACC and AHA came to Belgrade and one brave man, and that is Dr. Rosenbaum, Cindy, Cindy, Lewis's, uh, Cindy Lewis's husband. And of course, Dr. Volkman and Dr. Martha Gulati, and we have these capes that a friend of mine actually made specifically for the occasion. We kept now producing them further for as a as our own red dress, so to speak. We got substantial support, as you see, but we got the support from the actually the government, which is the most important thing. So even some minor local oppositions. We fought it even better in the next year. We had Dr. Wenger in Belgrade, and it was actually one of our last uh, pre-COVID events in Belgrade that everyone enjoyed. And uh, I hope Dr. Wenger enjoyed it. <laughs> and finally, where I have to emphasize again, the support of women is one, as we didn't want to see our conference series somehow uh, mm, go dim in the light of everything that was going on with COVID and the fact that we could not, sadly, hold the live conferences we planned for the 
for our, our med school's uh, anniversary in December 2020, we organized a virtual one and actually all of our speakers were co-authors in the paper. So finally, what are my key messages? And that is, you all know that I was also trained in France and someone who's very fluent in French. So I will never forget what Dr. Wenger said in her Simon Duck address at ACC in 2019. And it was that there is nothing as powerful in his idea as time has come. And that is from Victor Hugo's History of a Crime, Histoire d'un Crime. So think that we are partners in crime when we come to that. The advocacy, the camaraderie, and the support that I got from the ACC WIC, and these are our our pictures from Jada, um, when we organized actually with Dr. Alice Naj, the first round tables, why we wanted to do the round tables, because actually we got our guidance from the round tables uh, uh, sessions with WIC for every uh, ACC that we attended. And finally, they say that, it, you know, Nelson Mandela said that it always seems impossible until it's done. And these are some very nice pictures from 2019. Key year for everything with Dr. Kifa. Also, we were just rooting for our new Madam President of EAPCI, and we finally got her this year. So, I'm going to close with something. This was a workshop that I organized for our students at our student climate students conference. Sorry, that's a bunch of Cyrillic letters and a bunch of people you don't know, but who are local stakeholders who are helping me actually finally have our door, doors open under 30 days. We're gonna get have our final da final dates for both the physical opening and the big conference. You are go all gonna get invited to, to our national assembly that is, that is supposed to be end of June. And finally, as I told my students just a couple of weeks ago, I think no matter in which culture we were brought up or what religion we practice, we have to bring back to our homes what's the best of the education we got with in the centers where we were trained. And my first best lesson in the United States that I got was, if you don't ask, the answer will always be no. And the second one is actually the, the comprehensive care that Georgetown teaches, and that's the cura personalis. I, as everyone pretty much know, I'm, I'm Orthodox Christian, I'm Greek Orthodox. Uh, Georgetown is a Jesuit university, but they always considered me their daughter the same way I felt it as home. So I think, the most important thing, as I say shukram today, I say hvala in Serbia, and I say grazie mille to our Madam President, and a big thank you to all for hosting us today, and I'm zipping it now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Parapid. Dr. Cindy, your turn. Thank you. Uh, if I allow me, please, to share my slides. Uh, uh, Dr. Parpade, if you don't mind, yeah, you can I'm stop sharing. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Did you manage to share? Not yet. Uh, not yet. I think you have to stop I, sharing, yeah, Juliana. Yeah, I did. It's just that it's not allowing me to stop. There you go. Go. Perfect. Yes, you go. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Right, let me just share the screen. All right, so uh, I actually will be as brief as I can because I think we're already uh, passing uh, eight o'clock here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wakar and ladies for the invite. Uh, my name is Annie Cindy. I'm a pulmonologist and uh, intensivist, and I'm actually an executive uh, healthcare uh, manager in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Dr. Wakar uh, kindly invited me to share our experience as an ambulatory uh, healthcare services or centers uh, at one of the organizations here in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I'm just going very briefly here about describing our journey with establishing ambulatory women health uh, care services, which include obstetric gynecology, cardiology, and all the ancillary services that are required to run these services. I'm just uh, briefly going to outline uh, what exactly you need uh, in terms of uh, developing a proper facility that match the requirements uh, of such uh, healthcare services, what services are actually needed, the challenge, and very briefly, our experience. Uh, we actually found that developing uh, uh, ambulatory healthcare centers that are actually proximal to patients, especially obstetric patients and women who actually sometimes have difficulties 
getting into uh, really busy tertiary care centers with being occupied and uh, busy with their lifestyle. So the proximity actually played a major role. Uh, the convenience to reach these centers and uh, the parking, uh, waiting areas, uh, actually the design, because the whole concept of providing ambulatory healthcare services is not actually a, a very old concept. So the recently, as you can see here, these are examples actually from the States. I elected not to post our centers images, uh, but uh, actually centers from the United States where they represent what actually we provide in uh, our centers in Saudi Arabia. The uh, services, as you all know and mentioned in uh, your presentations, which were lovely, uh, about the variety of medical services that are required to provide the comprehensive uh, healthcare services for women. And this includes uh, the medical subspecialties, in, uh, mainly cardiology, as well as endocrinology, because we have diabetes here is a very prevalent disease. Around 50% of our population are diagnosed with diabetes. Uh, so this is actually a quite essential specialty that we provide uh, uh, in the ambulatory centers. Now, of course, uh, uh, as a standard, all centers uh, should have uh, uh, at least uh, basic laboratory services as well as radiology that are needed all the way from a basic ultrasound all the way to a CT coronaries that are done under certain standards and policies uh, uh, to ensure safety are uh, taken care of. Uh, emergency transfers are actually vital, uh, especially for emergency, uh, as uh, previously described, uh, women actually have high risk of cardiovascular illnesses and complications. So uh, one of the main things to establish an ambulatory center is to have a, a, a well uh, done and arranged uh, transferring uh, plan to the nearest tertiary care facilities, uh, just to ensure a proper transfer to the uh, proper center uh, that provide actually an emergency uh, uh, services. On-site deliveries, we had actually uh, uh, patients uh, who actually arrived uh, in our emergency room uh, for delivery. And uh, actually we had no option other than delivering the babies. Uh, we have an emergency room consultant who are trained uh, to do so. And as soon as the patient and the baby are, were stabilized, we usually transfer them to ensure everything is actually being uh, delivered in the appropriate way. So all these actually requirements or prerequisites are really vital because the last thing you would like to have in a ambulatory center is a catastrophe uh, due to lack of services because it is just an ambulatory center, not a tertiary nor even a secondary care. Uh, next slide, I'm just gonna pass. Uh, uh, supporting services are vital, especially for patients who need actually extra care being uh, uh, fully satisfied with the care being provided, customer service, Insurance and approval team, as maybe Dr. Hanan mentioned, sometimes could be a challenge because usually contracts and policies of insurance companies are different in ambulatory care setup compared to a tertiary care setup. So all this has to be taken care of. Uh, patient experience team is now becomes a standard of care uh, because uh, officers of patient care experience sector, they actually just uh, uh, help uh, patients to receive the best care possible uh, to make that journey is uh, satisfactory, at least. Uh, probable challenges, uh, the operating cost to build uh, or establish an ambulatory center, uh, it is not actually uh, cheap, uh, especially that your uh, uh, revenue and uh, income from it is not as uh, actually good as a tertiary care setup because you lack the inpatient uh, revenue, the operating room, intensive care. Uh, so this actually is, is, is going to be a risk. Uh, marketing, uh, you actually need to heavily depend on marketing to absorb and attract patients around the area to come to your center rather than visiting the ordinary or the classic tertiary care setups. Uh, tertiary care agreement, tertiary care centers agreement are actually important and must be well established. Uh, as well as insurance coverage and medical records integration, which is uh, sometimes a challenge for uh, uh, women uh, patients who actually would like to have certain procedures elsewhere, 
uh, in an inpatient facility. And this actually leads sometimes to some lack of information uh, if the systems are not connected to each other or the patient and the provi healthcare provider have no access to medical records. But uh, with the current uh, new solutions, uh, cloud solutions, these actually problems are now being uh, really uh, taken care of with a better care and service. Um, I think that's it. Uh, in brief, our experience, I'm actually now leading a second, uh, my second organization in establishing ambulatory centers. I used to run five centers uh, that are operational. All of them uh, provide uh, healthcare services for women, including obstetrics, gynecology, ultrasound labs, and uh, emergency uh, services if needed very well actually perceived by patients. Uh, it's actually strongly recommended. And it's actually offload the, the crowdedness, uh, the load, the dissatisfaction actually from, from patients in tertiary care setups. And I think it's going to be a new uh, era of uh, providing healthcare in, uh, in our area at least. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Cindy. Um, I don't know how much more time we have, but I, I wanted to see if Dr. Nasser would like to say a few words. Dr. Lakshmi Mehta unfortunately had to see a patient, but uh, Dr. Nasser, um, would you like to um, give us some idea of what's going on in Egypt for women? Actually, I'm fascinated with all these presentations because uh, uh, it's really very important and I'm very uh, happy to uh, hear this lovely uh, session for heart disease in women. Um, really, I think that uh, heart disease affects women of all ages and uh, ethnicities. It, uh, it is uh, actually the leading global cause of death uh, for women. Uh, and I think I have learned a lot from what you have said uh, and uh, actually that uh, in, in all over the world, there is underestimation of the women uh, in uh, the research work, we don't have uh, a lot of data uh, about uh, research in, in, uh, in different countries all over the world. I don't think there is difference between uh, developing and developed countries. I think there is all the, all the are deficient uh, and the data available. I am fascinated with uh, uh, the, uh, um, the, uh, the heart centers, uh, the, care, the centers for care of the heart of ladies. As uh, Professor Wigner have said, that the, the data, the electronic, uh, um, you know, uh, role in uh, the digital health, uh, the importance of the ambulatory centers are all very nice ideas, and I think it's very important. And I am very uh, happy to share in this uh, amazing webinar, and uh, I really uh, congratulate the Saudi chapter for uh, Professor Mervet for uh, saying because of her uh, this very important and elegant initiative for uh, the health of women. Um, so I do think that uh, we need in the coming uh, uh, time to uh, to uh, to think about. Uh, uh, we, we have to have initiative all over the world to do this. And uh, we have to say, what, why is it important to, to talk about cardiovascular disease in women? Um, and I think we have uh, to stick that many women don't know that heart disease is severe. It's, it's even uh, in Egypt, for example, um, being a, a member of uh, the health sector of the National Committee or National Council for Women in Egypt, uh, I assure that, uh, of course, uh, that uh, cardiovascular disease, for example, in Egypt is eight times uh, deader uh, than breast cancer. So I think that we are open. The awareness is very important. Uh, so, um, the disease matters, uh, deserves attention, awareness, and action. I think the key is prevention. Uh, I think the risk factors for all chronic diseases are the same. Uh, we have to adopt. Uh, we have to have a reality for women disease, uh, diplomas for women disease. I think this will be very important. I'm very to share in the webinar. I enjoyed the session. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nasser. Dr. Alice Nag, I think I'm going to turn over to you since the time is, um, is way overdue for us to, to adjourn. Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for taking time from their schedules to be with us today. And um, I think I'm just going to repeat something I said earlier when we first opened the session. Um, it feels more like a task force or a group that we kind of learn from each other. Um, and as we start these new initiatives, it is important to go across specialties, across borders, and learn from each other. So how did they do it in Serbia? How are they doing it with the ACC, American College of Cardiology? How did Dr. Cindy establish several ambulatory um, projects? How did Dr. Um, you know, uh, Ada use digital health to help women? You know, they can't all leave their homes. Um, you know, how did um, Dr. Hanan start as an OBGYN going beyond just OB and gynae and starting to explore the other needs of the women? And use that as a starting point rather than starting from zero. Kind of learn from other people's experiences and hopefully um, collaborate to establish centers that can still um, collaborate even with patient care. So I conceivably can be seeing that we're doing physiologic testing for patients and I'm sending it to Dr. Kifo in Italy and she's evaluating it and giving us her opinion about Inoka. I can conceivably see that we're doing some MRI studies or looking into lipids, for example, and, and so on, and looking uh, and sending the information to Annabelle, et cetera, and kind of crossing borders, not just in establishing these centers, but even in the pathways and patient care and so on until all services are up and running and equal. And so really, really that is um, my ultimate goal in all of this hoping that we're looking at this as a task force and just a launching pad for what comes next and not just your routine you know webinar that is going to be archived somewhere so um dr waqar thank you i know that as governor of acp you are keen to cross borders and and bridge cardiology with internal medicine we've always seen you know cross paths with nephrology with rheumatology lipidology the diabetes medications that are now um, forefront in cardiology as well and want to thank you for um, endorsing and um, prioritizing women's health with that understanding and um, i'll hand over to you and and hope that maybe we can have some more concrete steps moving forward uh, from this webinar well first of all i want to thank you for bringing all these great speakers together uh, all our friends from US, Europe, uh, and uh, from Saudi Arabia. So I'd like to thank you very much. And it's definitely a goal of mine to bridge different specialties instead of working in separate uh, ivory towers, essentially. So thank you. I know we went over time. And I'd like to thank everybody for staying with us. And um, let's see where we can go forward from here. Uh, moving forward. So thank you very much. And I'd like to thank the ACP staff, Dana Cord and Wendy Rivera for running this so efficiently and being with us all this time. Thank you very much.